Good morning, at least to some of us, and thank you for joining us today. My name is David Talbot. I'm Managing Director and Head of Research at Red Cloud Securities, and I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on uranium today. We are going to hear from Aurora Energy Managing Director, Greg Cochran. Now, during today's webinar, he will provide an overview and outlook, and then we will take your questions. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Please type them into the chat box. But before we kick things off, first I need to discuss the fine print. During this Aurora Energy webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I direct forward look, I would direct listeners to their forward-looking statements outlined on page two of Aurora's corporate presentation. And that can be found on the company's website, auroraenergymetals.com. For Red Cloud Securities, I'd highlight this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note the call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. So please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on Aura Energy. Now, it's quite an exciting time for uranium and your uranium equities. Uh, uranium prices have over doubled since the beginning of 23, particularly since the supply demand imbalance was really emphasized last year at the World Nuclear Association Conference in September. Right now, we are pr see prices uh, sitting at $101 a pound. It went up yesterday after peaking at 106 bucks a pound a couple of weeks ago. The U.S. government has thrown its support behind nuclear power and the nuclear fuel cycle. They will be acquiring and funding the creation of Halilu fuel. Uh, and a Russian uranium import ban is working its way through Washington as well. Uh, uninterrupt, uh, sorry, unanticipated uranium production challenges in Kazakhstan and in Saskatchewan are also adding further to that supply demand gap. So, Greg, with that, why don't you take it away, sir? Great. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, where are, wherever you are in the world. Great to be with you. Good opportunity. Uh, thanks uh, to Red Cloud for the opportunity for setting this up. So looking forward to tell the story about um, what we, uh, we, we project as, and, and honestly uh, I can say, uh, you know, we're, we are at Aurora advancing uh, the USA's largest uranium deposit. And you'll see in the presentation that... Um, you know, that's uh, a, a, a not a, a bogus claim. It's a very real claim, and, uh, and that's what puts us in such a good position. Um, I will come back to the slide late, uh, later on in the presentation, but I thought I'd just hit everybody up front with some of the key attributes of this deposit and this project that we have and that we're progressing in the USA. Uh, first of all, it's a very well-defined large deposit with great infrastructure because this is... An historically a historical mining district that you know mining went on there for 70 odd years in Oregon so um, and and in Nevada across the border so we benefit from that um, you know some people when we first listed a few years ago we we're asking about how we intend to develop this you'll hear from the presentation tonight that we have a very clear pathway to development for the for the project itself and in our experience to date we believe that we are are in a really good jurisdiction, uh, both from a mining, but also from an overarching political uh, point of view, uh, given the support that David just mentioned for nuclear in the US and for re-establishing, importantly, re-establishing uh, the USA's nuclear uh, fuels supply chain. And of course, uh, you know, that's a lot of words, but at the end of the day, it's, it's the work that's underlying that and underpinning that that's the important aspect to demonstrate the progress we're making and the real potential of the project. Now, I will just jump into the overall sort of uh, pro process that I'll talk you through tonight. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the market itself. Um, there are imminently more qualified people out there that can make, uh, make comments, but I, I think each uh, CEO or managing director does bring their own uh, perspective on the market with often some unique insights. So I'll make a couple of comments on, on each of those points, but not a lot. So I won't waste too much time before getting into the detail, the more, slightly more technical detail of the project itself. So we'll look at what's happening in the nuclear space globally, just, you know, most excitingly, COP28, just uh, towards the end of last year and the subsequent 
knock-on effect and the momentum that's gathered since then, and then acknowledge the situation and supply. So we've got all this demand out there, what's happening with supply, and some insights given my, my personal experience in the industry over the, over the years, and then honing in on the USA specific and how we at Aurora and our project is so relevant to what's happening in the US today. So first up then, let's have a look at, uh, at the renaissance that we've experienced in, and, and have been pretty much evolving and gathering momentum over the last 45 years. Um, you know, I was there at the time of obviously Fukushima um, whilst running Deep Yellow for, for five or six years during that, that nadir that we experienced in the industry. And, and that's all changed, you know. Now, uh, I mentioned COP28 earlier on uh, and all these commitments, USA, UK, France, right on the back of that COP28 uh, document and agreement with the 22, 24 odd com com countries, they've also, you know, followed up with their own individual commitments to, to triple nuclear. Um, and then there's all this host of other activity going on, be it, uh, somewhat new, in inverted commas, uh, kids to the block in terms of believing in the future of nuclear, whether it's Sweden, the wonderful success story that Barakai in, in the UAE is, that all underpins this wonderful demand scenario leading forward into the future. And so much of that is about decarbonization. It's not exclusively decarbonization. Obviously, um, energy security is a key factor in thinking about uh, how we power our grids going into the future. Um, but, you know, there is this stark reality that, um, you know, if we are going to decarbonize and make sure that each country has or is able to maintain its own level of energy security, base load power is fundamental and essential to that, and clean base load power is essential to that, and nuclear has demonstrated over and over again, time again, that is the way to go. Supply presents a different picture, though, and this is perhaps not that much. I know David said, you know, surprise developments in Saskatchewan and, and, and in Kazakhstan of late in terms of the ability of the world's leading uh, uranium companies to, uh, to actually hit their production targets. But, you know, some of us are not really that surprised because, um, you know, it, it is no matter what the price is doing and, and you know, this is a great price. It's a great incentive price for us to get our skates on and start developing. But just because it's a high price, as we've seen historically, doesn't necessarily mean that we deliver more and more uranium. It takes time. And, you know, that shortfall is just getting worse and worse by the day and will continue to do so for the in, in the short to medium term until we then see more pounds coming out of the ground. And if anybody suggests that we can rely on inventory for much longer, that has been the case since you know, post the Fukushima era when, when mines were mothballed, that is not the case. We are at a level of inventory globally that is right for size for where the industry is at today, number one. And number two, the inventory that people think might be available is not mobile inventory. And it cannot just initially, are we going to swap something in Japan for or something in the States or in France or, 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 or the UK for that matter. So that's, that is, is often a, a, a misnomer or, or a misunderstanding to the nature of the market and the nature of the inventory. And yes, honing in on the other the point that Dave raised, uh, yep, supply, unfortunately, despite the high prices and the great incentive prices, is more uncertain than ever before. Um, you know, Kazakhstan, having had direct involvement in the development of, of three mines and two joint ventures in Kazakhstan in, in the heydays leading up to sort of 2010 with Uranium One, we experienced exactly some of the similar problems that they experienced today. Shortages of sulfuric acid. In fact, we committed to, uh, uh, together with Kazadam Prom and our Japanese joint venture partners at the time, a massive sulfuric acid plant that was, that was built. Um, but today, not enough because they can build the acid plant, but you've got to secure the sulfur as well. Um, and then, of course, just like Budanovsky 6 and 7 is proving to be challenging and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future, we at Uranium One in our joint ventures also faced teething problems with one of our projects. Whereas 
you know, the others went along, Inkai, uh, South Inkai and Ekdala were wonderful success stories. So, um, yeah, swings and roundabouts, but you can't turn on uranium production just overnight or over a number of years for that matter. Okay, so that's the global perspective. And, of course, the resurgence that we're seeing in the U.S. is part of that reflected in, like, this rude awakening that nuclear is absolutely essential it's got wonderful public support, in fact, the highest ever, um, and it's got bipartisan support. And yet, you know, we live in this now bifurcated world in particular since the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And yet the U.S. has still getting almost half of its uranium from Russia or nuclear fuel services from Russia or former Soviet bloc countries. And whilst we're perfectly happy to deal with uh, Kazakh, you know, Kazakh and Prom and Kazakhstan and, and, and Uzbekistan. The challenge is there that that product comes through Russia, out through St. Petersburg, and there are alternatives to transport um, routes that are challenging and that add up to ten dollars a pound as well. So not easy. Have they their own geopolitical risks um, and are more expensive and take longer. So that's the Caspian route is is not a an easy solution to. Oh, we can just deal with the Kazakhs directly. And so much of their production, more and more so, is going to Russia or to the east, to China. Um, and yes, you know, the U.S. has had boom and bust before. Um, but what we're seeing now is something new in terms of now the demand for nuclear and for uranium is underpinned by fundamental economic reality. Um, and economic principles, whereas historically that wasn't the case. And so that's why you had the boom and bust, because it was driven by non-economic uh, issues, uh, whether it was weaponization or then denuclearization, which then flooded the market, uh, etc. And so to address the shortfall in uranium in the U.S., um, you know, we're seeing plus address the global issues in terms of geopolitical issues we're seeing all all these this development uh, on the political front with uh, you know the, the the banning of of or prohibiting of, of russian uh, uranium supply to the u.s been through the house and will imminently go to the senate and by all intents and purposes our reading is that that will pass and and yes you know there there are uh, exclusions that you need to go through a formal procedure but it will be triggered within 90 days if signed into law and then any utility that wants to source uranium uh, from russia will have to seek an exemption from the doe and that is not a slam dunk uh, you know so so be mindful of that and of course the other overarching risk to that is that russia turns around and just cuts off supply anyways and under those circumstances it's going to be interesting to see how our sector in the U.S. actually does source its uranium. We believe certainly for the short term, it's OK, but the medium term, which fits in nicely with our development strategy and likely timing, um, is absolutely uh, you know, puts us in a sweet spot to deliver into um, what would be a very tight market in, in the future and times to come. So back to that slide that I opened up with. Um, just reminding you, we're just inside Oregon uh, in southeast Oregon, but our, our, our um, uh, project uh, actually straddles both sides of the border, and, and you'll hear more about that in a minute. I mentioned the fact that uh, you know it has good infrastructure, but let's just think about the deposit itself, first of all, and, uh, and you know, the scale of the deposit. And there's not always just about scale and that's why i show two bar charts on this particular graph when i talk about uh, aurora's deposit first of all there is scale and it puts us up there with the largest or allows us to make the claim that we are the largest mineable measured indicated uranium deposit in the us but on the other hand we recognize that the nature of that resource in that part of the world, um, you know, the average grade of the of the global resource may not be that attractive. But fortunately for us, we've got this shallow, high grade core, almost 20 million pounds running at, at, at close to 500 ppm. Uh, and some people may question high grade core. Of course, it's all 
in understanding the geology and, and, and the nature of the processing. So this is a conventional shallow open pit operation with free dig, free dig. And that's what makes that a high grade opportunity. Bearing in mind, um, you know, our peers in the industry in Malawi or, or you know, uh, Botswana um, or Namibia, you know, some of them have similar grades. Many of them have lower grades, and uh, and and you know, one needs to bear that in mind. So, a nice, easy, uh, easily accessible, free dig, uh, high grade core, which, in global circumstances, may not seem to be that significant, but in the U.S., that would underpin a 10 to 12 year operation at levels of production that have really been seen before in the US, which so often has been made up of smaller satellite operations feeding centralized mills. So, you know, as I mentioned right at the beginning, 70 odd years of historical mining has has, has landed us in the in in, in the you know right in, in the, 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 the prime grid spot um, and grid from a a motor racing point of view, but also from an electricity point of view, um, because that historical mining needed the infrastructure. And so we do have access to power, sealed roads, a local township, the major highway coming through uh, the, 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 the township nearby. Um, and our plant site, you know, sealed access, uh, sealed roads, eight odd Ks, five miles or so from the town itself. The reason why it is so well defined resource is we certainly have done a lot of our own drilling since the deposit was acquired by our own predecessor company from Uranium One back in 2010. But well before then, Plaza Amex uh, actually drilled it out in the 70s and did an immense amount of work of which we acquired 43 boxes of data when the, the project was, was acquired. Obviously, I wasn't involved at the time. And, you know, we've been able to tap into that, in particular on the metallurgical side, extensive work done by, by Hazen, uh, you know, really, you know, and, and I visited Hazen, Hazen subsequently to discuss that work and, and work that they may need to do for us um, in the future. And some of the individuals are still there and, and, and are still active, which, which is wonderful continuity. There is something, though, that you'll see later on, uh, that is new to the story, um, and that was work that was done some time ago that we are busy recreating as a part of our metallurgical test work study for our scoping study. Um, and, and that is the potential for a, 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 a simple yet effective beneficiation step. Okay, I, we, we termed, when we wanted to address um, this question about how we see the project evolving over time and, and how do we get it right that we have faith in, in getting a, a mine off the ground in Oregon, um, we coined the phrase, we're going to develop a clear pathway to development. And, and in, in, in the early days, just after we listed, we did envisage ending up on BLM ground land in Nevada for our plant to take advantage of the fact that Nevada is a, is a, is a world leading, well recognized uh, mining jurisdiction that really understands mining. Um, but we actually went one step better. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be, become aware through our network in the community, which has been long standing, more than 10 years, um, that there was a, an available uh, plot of private land for sale, 410 acres. And we picked that up, and, and that was ideally located because it is right. Uh, we, we, you know, this, the substation for hydro being fed in from Oregon is right on the corner of that land. Um, so, you know, multiple advantages. First of all, problem solved, private land, you know, ideal way to operate um, many things in the U.S., in particular your processing plant or the mining operation, but then also benefiting from that infrastructure that I've mentioned on a number of occasions. And then hydroelectricity, so clean, green, cost-effective, six and a half U.S. cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, you don't see anything uh, close to that uh, in in some of our competitive nations uh, and, and, and operations. You know, Australia, you'd be lucky to come out and talk in U.S. cents. You'd be lucky to get in under under 20 U.S. cents per kilowatt hour. So um, a huge benefit for us, um, just natural inherent competitive advantages. And of course, the geology, and I'm not going into any detail about this, but the geology 
is unusual in that part of the world in that the overlying lake bed sediments predominantly host lithium and we've intersected lithium in some 40 odd holes and tested it and those results have been published and out there but we are a focused uranium company um, and we are in the process of dealing with the fellow Aussie by the name of Macrometals who have an option over the lithium component of our project and that means you know the mining a small component of the lithium potential if we're mining the uranium deposit the overlying lithium deposit, and they are geologically discrete, can be stockpiled and used later on for, for that for, for macros purposes. So what's that space? But it's not something that's distracting us. Our full-time occupation is is and focus and strategy is all on the uranium and, and telling the uranium story and progressing uh, the uranium project. I mentioned, uh, you know, this beneficiation test work that's been done that gave really encouraging results. And I've always been uh, quite a, a supporter of, of going down this approach. And, and we've seen it in uranium uh, in, in, in different guises and, and different approaches that's been very successful. At its most simplistic level, um, you know, radiometric truck sorting at Rossing going back decades to a very effective uh, you know, two-step beneficiation process um, that Langer Heinrich, uh, that, that Paladin developed, um, you know, that was instrumental in the success of that operation. Uh, and, and a similar design seems to be uh, uh, contemplated for Deep Yellow's Tumus resource, which is a similar calcrete, um, as well as, of course, Elevate Uranium that developed their own um, upgrade flow sheet and, and patented that approach. So, you know, beneficiation is nothing new in uranium or in the rest of the industry. However, it's got more importance over time um, as grades have dropped is into, into how we can reduce the back end of the plant. And in our case, the indicative results were, you know, we could have um, a 30% reject, but still recover 90% of the uranium based on a very basic scrubbing and wet screening process. That could be uh, finessed. Uh, and, and, you know, we're in the first stage of that now with the uh, metallurgical test work we're conducting at ALS uh, here in Perth, ALS um, Laboratories or Geometallurgy. Uh, but, you know, time will tell whether we stick to that or, 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 or actually are able to get an a more important and more effective beneficiation step because the advantages are, are tangible. They are very real, they're measurable, and they go straight to your bottom line because your capital costs are likely to be lower because you reduced the milling circuit and your leach circuit, um, you know, plus then of course your operating costs are lower because you've, uh, you know, feeding in a sweeter product um, and you've got rid of uh, harder material, which is not in low grade, but it's also material that is difficult to leach um, from our understanding uh, of, of the geology of the, of the deposit. You know, so the back end leach circuit, your, your, your recovery actually goes up. And it offsets what you know your, your losses in the ten percent in the reject material. So a great result, and we're looking forward not only to recreating that work um, with the current level of metallurgy test work, but also taking the next step, which is understanding the final steps in the leach circuit, which will then drive the conceptual flow sheet design uh, and costing for the scoping study. On the subject of the scoping study. Uh, we've been underway now for uh, we're into our third month. Um, you know, one of the key drivers of that uh, is the metallurgical test work program being conducted here in Perth. That commenced in September or so last year. Labs, as we know, globally are busy, uh, in particular in uranium. There's so much going on, so it's not entirely under our control in terms of the timing. And and at this stage, it's still a program that needs to be operated in series, although there are other multiple steps that we we are contemplating to try and accelerate the program. But we're encouraged by the progress to date, and as soon as the, where there is something worthwhile to report on um, and meaningful results, we will be doing that. So what's the space? That's the opportunity for, for news flow as we continue. Uh, we've engaged Orlogy, 
uh, well-known and respected mining consultants and no strangers to, uh, to uranium um, to be doing the mining studies and also assist us with the transport trade-off. Obviously, the base case would be uh, just bringing in a contractor and trucking uh, the ore, the eight odd kilometers down the hill from the mine site down into into Nevada to the to the plant. Um, but given that we've got this wonderful electrical supply that's clean, green, and cost effective, um, you know, we believe that is also uh, really worthwhile to investigate mechanized uh, means of transporting the ore. And um, you know, so we've engaged a pipeline consultant who are doing pumping tests for us um, and a rheology tests to see whether or not um, you know how how we could pump material and, and what what size fraction could be pumped. Or the alternative one is a sophisticated uh, what's called a rope conveyor design, um, which which has uh, certain advantages as well. So within the scoping study, we'll work all of those out. What's this? space for news flow on each of those studies as we go along um, and then we'll pull it all in uh, together in the scoping study which we're still aiming to complete around the end of this this quarter this existing quarter so it's intense at the moment and we've got lots of balls in the air um, but but you know that's what makes this really exciting space space to watch because before you know it we'll have the solution and we'll be out there uh, telling the world about uh, the successful scoping study that we that we've uh, that we've done, but it's not just about the technical work. We recognise that we live here in the world. You've got to figure out a clear program and a pathway to permitting. And um, in the US, you know, it's well known that it can be challenging. But you know, I've yet to come across having permitted a number of mines, uh, you know, including most recently Honeymoon Uranium in, in South Australia, where it's still part of Uranium uh, One and and uh, a very large uh, sulfate potash deposit and project in, in WA. It's never easy anywhere in the world, and in particular in, in first world developed jurisdictions. So we're following the plan uh, by uh, making sure that we can get an exploration plan of operations in place, which allows us to have um, a larger footprint um, that's required would enable us to do things like you know, bulk samples and you know, water testing, and air quality testing, etc. And work is already well underway with that. We did our first cultural survey for this purpose um, in summer months last year, and that component of the report is largely complete, but there is still a component that still needs to be done, and I have an up, up, update uh, discussion with, with our, uh, our environmental consultants and, and cultural uh, consultants tomorrow morning on that. So, uh, you know, that's... Uh, something that's not a showstopper, um, it just will ha happen as a matter of course. Biology is also a, a key area of focus and we've completed our first biological study as part of the Invisible Exploration Plan of Operations last year and the second study will be completed before the end of February. Um, I mentioned this baseline needs assessment study and, and form and basically what that is, is it sets all the other baseline studies and the level of detail and accuracy that is required. And once that's finalized, then we'll know exactly what other components we will need to bolt on and get done in order to complete the exploration plan of operations. Um, but certainly we have got ahead of the game as far as some of the biology and some of the cultural work is required. Um, we haven't, however, also lost sight of you know, what we need to do for the future. And that's around the next logical step post the scoping study will be the PFS. Of course, because it is such a well-defined resource, there is no intention for us or no need for us to go out and do further resource drilling. But we will need to generate additional or more core, fresh core, for the next, the PFS level of metallurgical test work. Um, and so that program has already been designed um, and you, you can actually track it down in our previous announcement uh, announcements um, on the next phase of drilling. Uh, you will see that in, in, in and around or over the uranium deposit itself, there is a, uh, all the holes have been identified and have already been permitted with the, with the BLM um, to, to get, proceed, uh, get on the ground and drill. In Oregon, um, even notice level drilling, which means drilling 
below a, a five acre uh, disturbance footprint, you still need state approval. Uh, and so our applications are in as we speak with the state agency known as Dagami. Um, and, 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 you know, it's not a case of if, it's just a case of when those will be approved that would enable us, we envisage mobilization in summer to get that work program done to then get the next phase of metallurgical test work done uh, to get the, the scoping study underway. We're also in the background thinking about the structure and the permitting matrix and, uh, and we've done a lot of work already on that and taken legal advice on how the operation, the mine itself, will be permitted. And, uh, and, and you know, we, we're certainly getting much better insight into the requirements and still believe that from woe to go, once the scoping study is completed, so that we actually have something to talk about to the regulators, you would imagine plus or minus a, a three year or so uh, permitting program, which dovetails nicely with the PFS and the DFS continuing into the future as well. So that's it. I haven't mentioned anything about the corporate structure or the snapshot and who we are. I like to address you know, the, 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 the key issues around the project itself and the exciting nature of the project. We did have some new news today. Um, we welcomed a new non-exec director by the name of John Gardner there. Um, you know, John brings with him great experience in, in investor relations, corporate strategy and funding. Um, so he's a wonderful addition to the board uh, and has significant uranium experience as well. And some of those that have been in the game for a long time might have met him along the way uh, when he was busy advising uh, companies such as Extract Resources that as you may or may not know was acquired by CGNPC for two plus billion dollars um, in around about 2012, uh, the Namibian uh, project uh, in Swakop. So really good uranium insights, good network, uh, and, and a welcome addition to, to the Aurora family. Uh, apart from that, um, you know, still well well funded for our current requirements, um, 2.6 million as, as of uh, the end of the quarter, as we released in, in our quarterly, or reported in our quarterly report, which went out yesterday. So our cash burn, despite the fact that it's escalated in the, in the last month and the coming months for the scoping study, is low compared to some of our peers. And so we're comfortable with that position at the moment. Uh, as far as the register, register is concerned, we've got a reasonable balance of previous owners that are still back in the company. So um, there's you know, nobody jettisoning us, as well as uh, a few well-known uranium funds on the register as well. So uh, an interesting makeup there. And, you know, with a share price like that and a bit of volatility that we've seen over the last six months and, and, and a regrating coming off our low in May last year when uh, when when we, we, we did go to the market to raise additional capital, uh, we now are, are in a, a strong position in an ever-strengthening market with what we believe to be a significantly undervalued asset compared to our peers. And so, you know, on that basis alone, when you look at that final point on this particular slide about the tract evaluation, and then you consider everything that I've explained in the presentation, which underpins those other three points, I think, you know, we are really well positioned. And this is a story that, um, you know, is worthwhile watching uh, and, and certainly um, supporting uh, as we take the project forward. So thanks for your attention. And um, I'd welcome uh, any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, great presentation there. You covered a lot of topics in uh, fairly <laughs> good detail. So we are now going to kick off the Q&A portion of the webinar. Reminder to everybody online, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. Uh, and we've already got some questions here, and I guess this one is for me. But uh, you know, you've, you've already been involved in the uranium sector for many years. You know, we, I think we met about 13 years ago when, when you ran Deep Yellow in Namibia. Do you feel that this nuclear renaissance is different this time around than it was back then? This is this is unparalleled. Yeah, you know. Um, what we saw at the time, um, and it might have even been, I don't know if I hosted you in Kazakhstan in the Uranium One days, perhaps, Dave, so it was even before then, before the yellow, but, yeah. um, you know, what we're seeing now, at the time, 2007, um, the West was in decline, um, and there were no material commitments to new build, 
Um, and, you know, we were reliant on China and India and, and you know, that was about it, growth, uh, and, and Japan steady state. Now, however, it's dramatically different because all of a sudden there has been this rude awakening and, and across the board, apart from strange outliers like Germany and Australia, the rest of the world has woken up and is committed to nuclear. And, and that's why this is so dramatically different. The, you know, the, 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 the fundamentals underpinning this growth are, this is a first of a, of a kind. Mm -hmm. Now, this supply uncertainty you were talking about, this mm -hmm. is the first time I'd ever heard that the World Nuclear Association, which is a fairly conservative group, come out and say that not all nuclear power plants are going to get the uranium they need in the future, yeah. uh, which really started the ball rolling uh, with quickly with uranium prices in September. Uh, how mm -hmm. confident do you think that these prices are going to su sustain? You know, uh, we, we've seen a $10 per pound rise already this year to 101 a pound. Yeah, look, um, once again, I want to pinpoint that, that comment about you know, the fundamentals are so solid and so sound. So for the first time, let me flip that uh, in a different way or, or explain the different way. You know, I, I, I dabbled in mineral economics as a postgrad, and 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 you know, I have a keen eye for for the overall economics, mineral economics of the sector. And in reality, this is a sector that has never been driven by rational economics until where we are today. So there were always other things going on that 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 overshadowed the market and the pricing of uranium. Whether it was sadly in the 50s and 60s, you know, nuclear weapons build, or then destocking nuclear weapons in the 70s, 80s, and then you know the H, the the, the uh, down blending of nuclear weapons from Russia from 1990 to 2010, all of that overshadowed the market and and the requirement to have genuine trigger prices to incentivize production. That's entirely different now because there's no longer any of that material to overshadow or overhang the market. And now rational economics needs to prevail to draw that supply out of the ground. Yeah. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about the project here. You know, the Aurora Uranium Project in, is in Oregon, and that's not a typical uranium mining jurisdiction. Uh, you did cover the infrastructure quite well, but maybe can you tell us a little bit more about the permitting regime and then what yeah. is the stance, uh, status of licensing for both the mine and the process plant? Yeah, so the, the, what I, the detail I didn't explain in terms of why we have this, this two-state strategy, I guess, uh, in terms of the processing plant in Nevada and the mine in, in, in Oregon, is that Oregon's not anti-mining per se, um, there are plenty of quarries out there, and in order to get a mine, as in a quarry with no processing or no chemical processing, up and running, is a well-trodden path. And in fact, you know, there's a good case study to be to be had there, where an Aussie junior back in 2010 or so did commence, did build, did develop, did permit a mineral sands operation, which obviously was 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 gravity separation, so no no chemicals. So they, here, there is the evidence that an Aussie junior can permit a mine with no chemical processing. But all our advice to date has highlighted the fact that it becomes a lot more complicated if you take the next step and you say, we're going to take the mine and, and build a chemical processing plant. And it was at that point that the advice was, um, and this goes back a number of years, even before I was involved, so I can't claim any fame or any any direct involvement in this. It's, it's a strategy I inherited, was, you know, license the plant in Nevada because Nevada is is is, you know, aware of and familiar with chemical processing plants. That being said, and, I, and I'm seeing a, a, a question there in, in the chat box, um, the NRC, the nature of the agreement, and both Oregon and Nevada are agreement states, which means you can mine uranium, and, and both states can regulate uranium mining, but the nature of the agreements means that they can't regulate the processing. So there's a nuanced difference in, in certain agreements between certain states and the feds. And so the NRC will still have oversight and we will still need to permit 
the processing plant itself with the NRC. Good. That's a little bit different than other states. You know, you look to Wyoming or Utah or Texas, which are also agreement states, and, and essentially the state can do it all. So what you're saying is the state, the, the, the NRC still has to do the final license. Yes. So, so it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I was having this discussion some months ago uh, when this was brought to my attention. Um, is is this nuanced difference in in some of the agreements that certain states have with the feds? And um, so I asked what I thought was an obvious question. I said, "Well, it literally is just another clause in the agreement, and and why don't we just have the clause changed? What's involved in doing that?" And you know, the consultants were initially shocked that I would think of that. And then as we fleshed that idea out, it's actually not a stupid idea. And it could possibly take two odd years to actually, if you could convince Nevada and say, Nevada, you're this great mining state. Why would you let the NRC in on permitting a uranium plant? Why, why don't you guys do it yourself? Um, and you have total control. So it's an appealing idea. I'm not saying you know we're actively considering it, but it's something that is kind of on the whiteboard as in, hmm, okay, this is an interesting option. Okay. Okay. Now, social license also is quite important. Uh, maybe can you uh, talk about uh, you know nearby First Nations or I guess uh, you know native groups. Uh, you know there there have been some disputes down towards Thacker Pass. Uh, yes. which is on the other side of the border in, in Nevada as well. And this is hmm. you know, a little bit surprising sometimes considering lithium is the chief uh, green energy uh, mineral you, you typically yeah. think about. So. Yeah, yeah I, 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 you know, I've, I've seen the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the massive sun boards on the 95 uh, highway, you know, uh, people of, of Red Mountain and, and the protest groups it is a fringe process, protest group, which is often the case. Um, you know, I saw something recently about a, a woman being interviewed who was a formal tribal council for in New Mexico, protesting about something. And I thought that's interesting that you know the journalist goes and seeks out the former member of the tribal council and doesn't go to the chair of the tribal council or the spokesperson for the tribal council. Mm -hmm. And that's the case with what happened at Thacker Pass to a certain degree as well. So we've had our meetings with the Fort McDermott Piat. Um, uh, you know, who, who uh, you know, the reservation is close by um, and we've had a historical good relationship with them. Obviously, you know, there is fairly regular turnover in the tribal, tribal council on an annual basis. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, when I had my last meeting, the chairwoman has subsequently been, been replaced and I haven't had the chance to get on the ground to meet the new chair. Um, but yeah, so to date, the only sort of feedback that I've had from them is not, oh, it's uranium or, oh, it's a mine. It's keep us informed. We want to understand as you go forward what the process is and what you intend to do. They've not given us carte blanche, nor do we expect it. But we do you know, expect um, and to date have experienced respectful interchange of ideas. So clearly not anti-uranium not anti-mining um, and many of them you know have children who work far from home and and so there's that angle to it as well and in particular in the town as well which is a very small town um but but you know we wear our our our, our um, t-shirts you know uh, company t-shirts and and eat in the, in the local diner there um which is a casino given that it's nevada um it's the only place to have dinner so we don't shy away or hide away. We're very public, um, and we happily engage with anybody. And and you know, so nobody's um, thrown a beer in my face so far. <laughs> so, so pretty good. Yeah. yeah, fair enough, fair enough. So, and, and at this stage, have you seen much uh, support from the U.S. government, who seem to be working hard to support the Iranian industry, both directly and indirectly? No, we we to be honest, we haven't actively sought that per se. Um, we we are, are, are you know keeping our powder dry, so to speak, until the scoping study is completed. We we feel it's important to to not go with a half baked idea that oh look you know look we've got you know we've got uranium in the ground. We'd like to go to the DOE and explain to them well look what this can be, and and how can you help us 
to achieve a mutual common goal, which is domestic supply of uranium to the U.S. So, um, you know, I, I have um, met with the, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the um, uh, both the, um, the uh, forgetting the terminology, sorry, getting late, um, uh, this, the senator for, for the district senator, district senator and district representative, uh, we had dinner with them the last time I, I was in the U.S. a few months ago, um, and, and also very supportive, but also very openly inquisitive. Uh, this is this is not a, 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 a we don't expect a free pass. We expect you know a considered evaluation, but they can see what's in it for the district, which desperately needs jobs uh, and 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 investment uh, and 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 infrastructure improvement. Right, right. Okay. Now, the Aurora project, it is somewhat unique. It's a uranium deposit below an unrelated lake bed lithium deposit. So what what sort of opportunity does that provide for Aurora Energy? Yeah, look, you know, we, we did list uh, to, uh, what's it, three, yeah, 20, yeah, 23, 24, two years ago on, um, on the back of a, 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 a con combined or dual strategy of lithium and uranium. But, you know, Long before the, this is not, we didn't give up on on lithium when the lithium price tanked. You know, we took a strategic decision in February last year, but we needed to focus on uranium, um, and you know, so we commenced a, a partner search. And you know, we're small; we don't have huge resources, so it's not as if you know we had this active data room and we were out there combing the world for a JV partner. But we, we made it clear in our presentations that we were seeking to do a deal on the lithium so that we could give, you know, 100% focus on, on the uranium. Uh, and so for anybody coming in, you know, for them, like Macro Metals now has this exclusive option over um, the lithium, they can have a look south to Nevada, um, to Thacker Pass being developed um, with massive support from the U.S. government really exciting time for the industry despite of course um, you know, lithium prices the reality is you know those projects and the one to our west owned by another fellow aussie genderly um, resources um, you know both of them need to get off the ground to ensure that the u.s has a stable domestic supply of lithium just like mines like aurora projects like aurora need to get off the ground for a secure supply of uranium, domestic supply of uranium. So they actually work well together and, and you know, we don't envisage obstructing each other, but but actually leveraging off each other. Um, you know, we do think that we would be first past the post to be developing the mine. And if that is the case, and I, I believe that will be the case, you know, what is above the uranium deposit is, is very small compared to the regional lithium play that that uh, the, the, you know, the claims that we hold the claim position we hold yeah so this uh, you know this lithium potential you know how much focus are you going to give to that and maybe perhaps tell us a little bit about the lithium processing JV that you arranged does that really provide you the expertise that you need being a uranium company does it remove risk to develop that what uh, what's that all about you hit the nail on the head there, remove risk for development. So it, it achieves a number of things. First of all, it allows us to progress the lithium opportunity indirectly without sucking up our own resources, time, energy, or effort, um, and allow somebody else who is hungry enough to focus on moving that forward in their own right. And because they're focused entirely on the lithium, their path and their progress would be quicker than us trying to do them both, uh, you know. So very clear strategy, you know. I lo lose no sleep at night thinking about lithium. I, I just focus on the uranium, and and it's up to them then to to lose sleep around. Oh gosh, you know, um, how many rigs are we going to have to bring in this season to to draw? Um, and you know, when you look at, and and this this largely cemented the decision making. When you look at a successful company like Jim Lee that has in resource terms, the largest lithium resource in the USA. Um, but it's taken them five or six years to get there. And that's 
good work they've done. This that's sort of criticism. And, you know, so for us, it's, well, you know, that's beyond the time we envisage it'll take for us to reach the development stage and, and be commencing production in uranium. Um, and if we then try to prove up this lithium deposit whilst actually trying to get ahead, it's just, it, it's, it's overwhelming. It's just too much. And, and hence the, the strategy, which we are now currently, you know, finalizing and acting with, uh, with, with MACRA. Mm. Okay. Now, beneficiation. You've looked at this elsewhere. Can you maybe discuss what steps, what steps you want to take in order to beneficiate the mineralization and what benefits that would provide to both CapEx and OpEx down the road? Yeah, I mentioned it briefly. I didn't go into too much detail in the presentation, but um, I'm a huge believer in, 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 in beneficiation. I, you know, um, as, as the world's um, you know, deposits in all minerals, uh, as the grade has declined, um, you know, the need to be smarter about how we do things has risen and of course the cost of energy has gone up and the quest to, you know, reduce your footprint, reduce your emissions, reduce your reagent consumption, um, all coincide with, gee, you know, how can we actually shrink what we're putting into the back end of the plant? And it's quite fortuitous that the nature, the geology of the resource actually plays into this really well in that in effect, um, you know, we have the, the, the higher grade material is in what are effectively enriched lava flow tops. So you've got these thick beds, you know, in, in, in many respects, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 meters thick of lava flow tops where hydrothermal fluids have come in and, and, and you know, basically impregnated the that those the, the vesicles in in the lava flow tops with uranium and and altered the material and so therefore it's softer than the intervening or intertwining layers of real volcanics hard volcanics so it makes the task of a scrubber quite simple in that you feed it in and uh, and and the hard volcanics is breaking up the altered material so when you go out over a screen um, and, and the screen was done, screening was done sort of sub 38 millimeter cut, um, uh, well, 38 millimeter crush size, should I say. And, um, you know, what we're getting is you screen 19 millimeters and below past the pseudo screen, um, and that carries the significant grade. And, and anything on the reject side plus 19 mil is, is sub 100 ppm. And it's not just the grade. It's where that uranium sits within um, the the volcanic rocks that we're talking about, the, the rhyolites or the, the basalts, and and that's really something that if you did try to leach it, your recoveries would be horrendous. So if you were to, as the old timers did, think that you could do whole of all processing, your um, power consumption in the milling circuit would be significantly higher. Um, so we've removed that by just scrubbing it and kicking and, and chucking it out. Um, so then you, you know your milling circuit is a lot simpler, smaller, and 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 your power consumption in terms of kilowatt hours per ton is is a lot lower, significantly lower. So that's a massive saving in capital, but also immediately you can see the benefits in operating cost. Yeah. And then feeding that into the lead circuit you're not wasting acid on trying to extract um, you know, uranium from this low-grade, hard-to-leach material. It, it leaches fairly readily. There are clays involved, and actually the finer you go when you look at the, the particle size differentiation, the finer you go in the material, the grade follows suit as well. You know, so there is an, a, 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 a component that could be 20 to 25% um, of the uranium contained in a small mass. And uh, so the back end of the plant is figuring out, is there a separate little step to, to resolve that and to treat that component versus then what one would call, call it the coarser middlings from 30, you know, 37 odd micron up to the sub 19 millimeters, that, that range, which is non-clay um, and of reasonable grades, ranging from, uh, ranging, should I say, from 400 ppm to 600 ppm. 
Okay. Yeah, that, that 51 million pounds that you have right now, mostly in the measured category, is is this resource a JORC compliant resource or an a Absolutely. Yeah, no. So I saw the question about the NI43101. So in November 22, if I remember correctly, we did the res we published the resource update based on the work that we had done. Um, and so that is uh, JORC 2012 compliant. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. And the, the, the increase, so two aspects uh, about that resource. Uh, first of all, even I personally was surprised at the increase in the size of the resource, but then I am conservative when it comes to that. Um, and then secondly, um, you know, what was inferred and what was indicated, there was a high conversion ratio to the next step to the measured and to the indicated level. So that was encouraging as well. Yeah. Okay. And speaking of technical studies, you know, the PEA is underway. So when, when do you expect that study? And do you have an idea of what flow sheet might look like or size of operation you might consider? Yeah, good, good question. So, yeah, well, I mean, um, there's a nuance between Canadian listed entities and, and an ASX listed entities in terms of PEAs versus scoping studies. So, you know, I would suggest that scoping studies have more meat on the bone. Um, than PEAs and and uh, you know if we were Canadian listed we probably would have put a PEA out in you know 2022 so um, you know we've relied on on generating this core to do this test work um, to then enable us to 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 do the, the conceptual flow sheet we've got some good ideas uh, we've got a number of alternatives and and you know we're looking at what we know today to see uh, what you know what needs to be costed and what needs to be proven in the metallurgical test work. And there is an option for us to say, okay, with what we know today, we can go with option X, Y, or Z, and we can cost that, or we can wait a bit longer and see the whole test program through. So at this stage, our objective is still to complete the scoping study uh, around about the end of this quarter. Okay, so it's coming fast. Yeah, and then, and, and then how quickly can you move on to a PFS and even maybe potential timing for what you're calling medium-term production visibility? Hmm. Yeah, you know, funding permitting, um, you know, we would love to go straight into the PFS. A key driver of the PSF would, would be PFS would be a higher level of metallurgical test work. Uh, for a higher level of confidence that is expected and, and, and demanded for, uh, for for a PFS level study. Um, and, you know, so that the, the drill program is, is, is designed um, and the permit is permitting is underway for that. Uh, so there's no other restriction for us apart from just getting the state permits to get on the ground to start drilling. And that's likely to be also suits us later in the year rather than earlier in the year. So it buys us plenty of time, better drilling conditions. Um, we cut it close to the bone the last time we drilled and we were there towards the end of November. <clears throat> and uh, and so that wasn't easy, um, not impossible, but if you consider what you and I experienced in Kazakhstan in minus 37, but <laughs> rather them than, than us in, in the US or anywhere else in the world. So, you know, we would like to get it done in, in, in mid-summer, uh, so August, September, October. We'll see how that, that goes, yeah. Um, and then the test work itself, um, things like hydrology, there's already been a, a lot of hydrological work done. Uh, we've engaged with um, the utility for energy and there's a process that one will go through that you'll highlight in the scoping study as well, uh, which is, is a, a well understood uh, path. And, and you know, there's a, a cost involved in, in getting on the list, but then it allows you to be you know, in position to be ready to receive that, that, uh, that electricity, I say, and when the time is right. Difficult to say how one goes, because there's so much that can happen in terms of funding and, 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 and you know, other things like other permitting that may or may not stand in our way. But, you know, we saw uh, a straightforward path to PFS, um, you know, nine months to 12 months and then straight into the DFS and another 18 months to the DFS and then financial decision making and then pushing the button, you know. So all up, difficult to commit to a time, but when I say medium term, I have in my mind meeting the crunch point and, and the more commentators you talk about that 2028 period of time and opening up there 
is when there is a real need for domestic uranium supply. The utilities are very much aware of that, uh, and that's the sweet spot that we're aiming at. That's exactly what I was going to say. Right on time for that filling that, helping to fill yeah. a major gap in supply. Yeah. Okay. Uh, given given the scale of of the resource, um, and and there have been historically some there has been some work done not with current information but on 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 sort of pit optimization exercise to see what stripping ratios and and what level of reduction might be uh you know it would be well north of a million hopefully closer to one and a half million pounds per annum for around about 10 to 12 years which once again in the global scheme of things people scratch their heads and say oh that's not so big in the us that is significant it's substantial and it is unusual and it is almost unique right okay well we're up on the hour so maybe just uh, one final question here do you need any additional personnel to move the project forward either at the management level or further technical expertise yeah look uh, I, uh, you know people uh, good people are hard to find in this space because there's so much going on and and you know we all have one, the most wonderful networks and we're fortunate you know many of us have been in and out or consistently in and out. I've been one that's been in and out, in and out of uranium. So we have these wonderful networks and we know people and talk to people, but we would certainly benefit from a greater presence on the ground in the US post the PFS. So, you know, that we can fly the flag um, and, and be more closely engaged with regulators and with community uh, as well at the same time. So we, we do see the benefit from, from building a bigger team, um, certainly on the ground, technical team on the ground in the US. Okay. Greg Cochran from Aurora Energy Metals, thank you for talking to us today. Great. No, thanks very much. I enjoyed the opportunity immensely. And uh, thanks for your facilitation, David. Take care. Enjoy your day. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody else, for tuning in. A reminder, the Red Cloud Securities, we will be back on Monday afternoon when I sit down with Peninsula Energy. So that's February 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much.